It says going live. Hello, everybody joining online, who probably is not yet here because it just started, but hello us. Um, so we'll do all of this uh, by linking ongoing efforts to the multi-faith priorities uh, to bring them and their importance to life. So what I have done is looked at all of your websites, which hopefully are accurate, more or less reflections of the work that you're doing. Uh, and thanks to assistance from Gopal, we have linked those efforts to certain segments of the multi-faith priorities. So we are joined today, and I'll give maybe a, a little bit more by way of introduction when we get to it. We're joined by uh, Goronga Das from the Govardhan Eco Village, by Sarah French from Arosha International, Caroline Kiru from the Laudato Si Movement, Kamran Shazad from <coughs> Bahu Trust, <coughs> Valerian Bernard from the Brahma Kumaris, and Gopal Patel from Bumi Global, and the COP15 coordinating group. So each of you on this first pass will have about four minutes, and I will do my best to be more or less strict, but loving, uh, four minutes to share a little bit about the work you're doing in the context of a certain segment of the multi-faith priorities. So uh, we will begin, we'll start from here and go left. So we'll begin with Gauranga Das from the Govardhan Eco Village, and he'll speak a little bit about the web of life. So from the multi-faith priorities, the segment that I've, I've selected says, as people of faith who believe in the sacredness of all life, we believe that the text, as the GBF text, needs to reflect the worldviews which are grounded in interconnectedness, interdependence, and relationship, and speak to the sacred wisdom and experiences of many people, including indigenous peoples, spiritual communities, and faith groups. And from your website, it says, at Govardhan uh, Eco Village, you lose yourself into the labyrinths of your innermost self using the time-honored snaps of Ayurveda, yoga, and meditation. So I'm curious how these two connect for you. You have four minutes. Thank you so much, Derek. The world population of almost 8 billion is divided into 2 billion, which has disposable income, and 6 billion who are underprivileged. And majority of the lacunae or imbalances created because of this. Understanding this, we from the ISKCON, Govardhan Eco Village, decided to look at how we can create harmony. Harmony with the self. Today, 300 million people across the world experience stress symptoms. 370 people every day commit suicide in India. So people in the cities, they are looking for peace. And we thought, let's create a wellness resort but created in a rural place. And that's what we have done, where through wisdom, Ayurveda and yoga, people can go through these stress. Then when they come there, we also have created temples, places of pilgrimage, because today, few places of pilgrimage, if billions of people want to visit there, it creates dichotomy, it creates problem in the ecosystem there, with the rivers, with all the holy places. So we have created a model where you can recreate a holy place. And that's what we have done by creating over 15 acres, a replica of the holy place for the Hindus, Vrindavan. Which means that in 768 districts in India, you can actually create a holy place of pilgrimage. May not be as per scale, but a toned down version, but it decongests pilgrims. Third, harmony with nature. The entire eco village we have created using sustainability principles, using 400,000 compressed stabilized earth blocks, which uses only 0.275 megajoules per kilogram as against 72 megajoules per kilogram of embodied energy with respect to regular brick wall. We have created harmony between food, water, energy, and waste. We have a zero waste command, which actually uh, brings about four million liters of treated water using soil, biobacteria, and reactors. And based on that, we have actually 4 million liters or 40 million liters of water available for irrigation every year. All sewage water, black and gray water treated, but using hardly any electricity. Then the fourth element is social impact, which we call as harmony with community. When you have harmony with the self, Harmony with divine, harmony with nature, with harmony with community, we realize that to break the cycle of poverty, you need three things. Education, livelihood, skill, 
and healthcare. And we have created in the entire district, working with 120 villages, we have created platforms by which we teach the farmers how to grow their own food using organic methods. We are training them how to do watershed management. We are training them how to educate their children in the best possible way, and holding them so that we are actually able to create and break through the cycle of poverty and create employment and engagement for them. But as an advantage of being a faith community, they're also able to break their cycle of addictions because in rural places in India, addiction is a big thing. Even if they have economic employment and generation of money, they lose all of that because of lack of control over habits. So these are the four principles at the eco village, harmony with the self, harmony with divine, harmony with nature and harmony with community. Thank you so much. Um, that's fascinating and very helpful. Um, and I'll, so what we'll do is I'll come back to you with a question afterwards. I'll ask the question now, but after I'll speak, then you can respond. So the question that I have for you is based on these really wonderful and impressive efforts. What are you hoping that those negotiating in the rooms next door would take from the experiences you shared? What messages do you hope uh, they can learn from your experiences? So we'll turn now to uh, Sarah French from Arosha International, and she's going to speak uh, to ambition. Um, and from the multi-faith priorities, this, this section says, additionally, the GBF needs to reflect the current and impending biodiversity crisis and increase ambition by addressing the drivers of biodiversity loss in a fair and equitable way for the benefit of present and future generations and all life on Earth. And so from the Canadian Arosha website, um, because Arosha International is too expansive, too ambitious, uh, I drew this quote, which says, Arosha is bringing hope through care of both people and places we're preserving sensitive habitats and threatened species, growing food sustainability and feeding people living on low income, inspiring school children and training young people. Arosha is changing the way people treat the earth. Can you share a couple of words from your experience on ambition and, and what Arosha is doing? Uh, thank you. Can I do that? So we'll <laughs> face one direction. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to have. Uh, an opportunity to be here today, thank you. And the Arosha Canada website is an example of the sort of work we do in every single country, about 20, over 20 countries around the world. We work in um, environmental education, uh, theological education, community-based conservation, and um, scientific research. So it, they all fall into those categories. It is, um, all the work we do is ambitious, to tell the truth. Uh, just the, the quote from transforming people and places by showing God's love for all creation, um, that's a huge amount of work to do. So what we do is we work um, with local people, the local people are, are there in those countries, and they are doing conservation in their own context. There's not one sort of thing that fits all. We have, um, obviously we have some values that are all start with a C, which is rather handy, like Christian and community and collaboration. Um, but to link it to what we're talking about today, um, we're a conservation organisation, so prioritising threatened species um, is something we are very, um, very near, dear to our hearts. So the example of Russia, Kenya, um, the only way to prioritise and look after these some species, um, the golden uh, front that is an elephant shrew or sengi or sokoke scots owl, was to, in the end, fundraised by land. That's, we've got 6,000 acres to create a reserve. Um, and the impact there is working with local people, uh, capacity building and changing their lives and their lifestyles as well, so that we could help um, look after creation. Another example uh, in India would be engaging civil society, um, working with grassroots com communities in Bangaretta um, forest. There, there's a big uh, problem there with human uh, wildlife conflict. So you can see what's quite a difference in those two projects. And then say something like working, engaging with um, uh, faith-based areas, um, engaging with churches, um, different denominations in eco-church where 5,000 churches um, have now signed up and are working on award systems, bringing into churches um, a new way of thinking and caring for creation. That's in the UK and England, and then there's also those in New Zealand and France and Switzerland. And for the biggest, biggest ambition, 
uh, we are members of the IUCN. Um, I don't know if you know all about that, but it's a big conservation union. And they had a big meeting, the World Congress in Marseille, uh, and they came out with the Marseille Manifesto, and that feeds into the CBD. And we're a voice there, um, very much working in the conservation area and also with the churches. We work in both sides um, and, and work to interconnect, interweave the ideas. And that manifesto, um, the biggest thing there was halting biodiversity loss um, and then and then restoration um, for the future. Um, and that so at all levels from grassroots all the way up to advocacy and um, government, that's that's where we are. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. So the question that I'll, I'll have for you when we come back is um, about how to, to maintain this unity of vision and, and how it, it finds expression in a diversity of contexts. So we're here at the United Nations trying to create a global uh, set of, of goals on this issue, and yet they will find expression in different contexts around the world. How do you deal with that complexity in your work and ensure that ambition is continu continuing uh, in that context? Um, so now we'll turn to Caroline Kiru from the Laudato Si movement. I don't know if any of, anyone in the room is familiar with Laudato Si. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a document that uh, may or may not be quite impactful for billions of people around the world. Um, and, and she's been asked to speak on a rights-based approach. Um, and from the multi-faith priorities document, it says integrating a rights-based approach within the framework will need to be clearly defined so that it addresses the issues of power imbalances between different groups and furthers rights of all living beings and the accountability of duty bearers. And from the website, it, uh, it says to inspire and mobilize the Catholic community to care for our common home and achieve climate and ecolo ecological justice. This element of justice, I think, is very closely tied to this uh, rights-based approach. So I'd love to hear your thoughts and perspectives, Carol. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for having Lauda to See movement present here. Um, Lauda to See movement, um, actually from the website, what you've captured is our mission, which is to inspire and mobilize Catholics. And um, addressing the rights concern is very well embedded and very much uh, referenced with the, within the Lauda to See. And <clears throat> we do, excuse me, we do use this Lauda to See as a tool conversations um, to begin the conversations within the congregations across the world. And so when we're talking about the rights-based approach, what are the rights? Uh, rights is recognizing issues around health. Everybody seated here today, um, you have your own rights, recognized even by the human rights, um, the United Nations Human Rights Convention around environmental sustainability. It's your right. So as we develop and as we as we engage around the biodiversity discourse we do recognize as loud to see movement issues around health covid 19 has been quite um, a time in our lifetime uh, where we will reference and recognize that when we stayed home when we were in our own spaces nature started to you know come back so definitely understanding the concerns that are tied within the nexus of a rights-based approach is quite key Another thing now that the movement is really pushing for is around resources, ensuring that we have the finances that elevate those rights-based approaches that we are discussing, um, especially looking at the local level knowledge. How do we bring in the local communities to ensure that their knowledge is not only presented but heard and embedded within the within the post-2020 global biodiversity framework and ensuring that we leave no one behind. So as different cohorts, how do we ensure that we elevate each other's conversations within the spaces that we are mandated or are present in? And I would like to finish with a loud to see quote um, that really encourages us, all of us to be present and to be urgent in our action. And I know we've spoken about ambition um, and now that you see uh, chapter 13 really, you know, kind of cements it and puts it together and it says that the urgent challenge to protect our common home includes a concern to bring the whole human family. And that's essentially the rights-based angle that we're looking at. So if we're able to bring the whole human family together to seek a sustainable and integral development, for we know that things can change. Um, from that platform, then we can take action. And that is what Lauda to see is looking at when it comes to uh, human rights based approach. Thank you, Dan. Fantastic. Uh, so the question that I'll try to pose to you 
uh, and forgive me if it's not fully developed, is, is one of dichotomies. Um, as certain rights are advanced, uh, for example, a right to development, there is a, uh, perhaps a concern that it could start to encroach on rights to a healthy, uh, healthy environment. How would you, in your experience and in your efforts, ensure that this dichotomy uh, is properly addressed and, and overcome um, to, to make sure that rights are fulfilled and protected, but also not to, be, to the detriment of uh, those of, of future generations. Um, so now we'll turn to Karan Shezad from the Baku Trust, uh, who will speak a bit about cross-cutting issues. So for the multi-faith priorities, it says an integrated approach, such as the One Health model, is required to address the complex nature of the biodiversity crisis. Solutions that are not holistic are incomplete and unsustainable. And from your website, it says, at the Baku Trust, we believe that preserving the environment is an act of worship. The faith of Islam gives a clear mandate to protect and look after nature. Uh, and then there are links for uh, imam training and education and plastic-free efforts and community. It seems all very integrated. So I, I would love to hear a bit about your experience uh, on cross-cutting issues, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, a bit about it being a, an act of worship. I mean, as Muslims, Islam is a way of life, not just a religion. So the way we eat, the way we drink, the way we do things. So when we eat, you know, we even eating is a form of worship. But what we don't want to be doing is eating something that's polluting our body. When we breathe, breathing is a form of worship, but we don't want to be breathing something that's toxic. Um, even when we pray, we pray five times a day. We, our ultimate act is to bow our head uh, and prostrate to God, where we put our head on the ground, there's the attachment to nature. Yet if our ground, if the earth is polluted, so all that forms part of the um, kind of holistic approach to what Islam should be about. So what we're trying to do is do a spiritual transformation and to um, relook at our teachings because being environmentally friendly is a new thing um, in the last hundred odd years. Before that, we all part well, with nature one way or the other. I think it's now because we're overdoing things. So it's taking people away from modernity. So we're trying to teach people, the, uh, change the way we use our uh, scriptures. But also, um, it's how do we put that into action? So the spiritual teaching is one thing, but the action is another. And everything we do comes from nature, comes from biodiversity. And in particular, we've been involved in a, um, I mean, there's lots of things that we've been involved in, but there's one project in particular, uh, which is called the Balsall Heath Nature Map. Um, because Birmingham itself, contrary to Gopal's beliefs about my home city, <laughs> is actually, a, it's classed as a biophilic city. Um, Don't believe that. <laughs> yes. Um, and one fifth of Birmingham is um, covered in trees, uh, and I think every household is no more than three miles away from a green space. It's just that we're so involved in that everyday life that we forget what's around us. So we, the 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 Muslim community and the Christian community have come together to develop a very sorry a very beautiful nature map. Um, where um, the Bahu Trust, which is a Sunni mosque, the Al Abbas Islamic Center, which is a Shia mosque, um, then we have the local churches. We've been exploring our own local neighborhood and everything we've been doing in our local area or everything we have, things that we tend to ignore. So we've created this map which puts nature at the forefront and not the streets, not the urban area. And the map itself is uh, is highlighting faith teachings. So it's allowing us to, because our teachings need to make us, you know, their communities with us, nature. And why is this important? Because Birmingham declared a, a climate emergency a few years ago. Um, and the UK parliament was the first parliament, I think, uh, the whole world to declare one. So when, a, when uh, the local council declares one, it actually has an impact on local communities, how do communities get involved in this? Um, because, um, so the, the local authorities route to zero strategy 
is also part of it is targeting the natural environment, the biodiversity emergency and environmental justice. And that means increasing nature features and tree canopies um, because all these contribute towards tackling the climate crisis uh, and also supports in improving the mental, the physical and the economic prosperity. And faith communities have a massive role in, in improving the prosperity of the community. So that's where Bahu Trust is involved in various different aspects of nature and biodiversity. Thank you so much uh, for, for that experience uh, in Birmingham. Um, so the question that I would ask of you, Kamran, is that as you referenced, uh, our spiritual teachings, many of them are quite ancient, and yet the problems we're facing are, are quite modern. And this could be used as an argument uh, from, from some, particularly in the, in the secular space, who would say that you know, we don't need the role of faith because this, these are all so old and these problems are so new. How might you counter this argument? What experiences do you have in, in um, addressing this potential concern? Um, so now we will turn to uh, Valerian Bernard from the Brahma Kumaris, who will speak a bit about production and extraction uh, through this idea of, of changing lifestyles. So from the multi-faith priorities, it says an ethical and holistic response to living in harmony with nature cannot occur without addressing the existing economic systems in place that must prioritize the well-being of people and the planet over short-term financial profit. And from your website, which I enjoyed reading very much, I enjoyed all the websites, I don't mean to play favorites, um, it says we all make mistakes, we all waste resources, we waste our words, our energy and our time until we pause and think deeply about what matters in our life. When we hold on tight to our views, the mind shrinks and smothers any power to love. But when we sit quietly, canceling all mindsets, and allow ourselves to know the deep peace of the soul, miraculous changes can happen for the better. So if you could speak a bit to this, uh, it would be lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Hello, Om Shanti. Lovely to be with you all. Thanks for arranging this encounter. Um, yes, definitely silence allows us to go into another dimension, dimension of spirit. And from the dimension of spirit, you start seeing, finding, understanding solutions from a very, very different position of the heart, I would say. So thanks to that, a few people from my university started thinking deeply around the topic of energy. Uh, so it addresses um, the topic that you're giving. Um, and so what happened is that they did a lot of study and research and we now have an amazing project uh, called India One that some of you might be familiar with and if you're not uh, Aneta in this room is actually working with India One so she could give you so much information. Um, this the one system, electric solar system that works 24 hours because the study we did, the research we did was on the whole topic of storage because as you all know, the problem with solar energy is that you can't really store it. You know, you have to use it as it comes. But there was the thought, and I'm sure this is connected with spiritual ingenuity, I would say, was that if we transformed it in heat, then you could store it. And it means you could use it always. And this energy is being used in our uh, place. Um, it cooks for 40,000 meals. We have a hospital that benefits from that energy. Um, but also, uh, we have been sharing the research we've done. So for us, this is also a spiritual principle that is contradicting the economic perspective that if you find something, keep it for yourself and make money out of it. We do the reverse. We share, we give, we come out and do trainings for people to be able to understand how to use it in their own ashrams, in their own hospitals. So we have like that. We used to be the biggest cooking solar energy provider place. And we've given the knowledge and now there are bigger ashrams that are cooking for more people. 
But I would like to say um, a bit about another project, which is called Yogic Farming. It's an amazing project because, like our colleague here from India shared, there is a lot of addiction in India. So what we did is go around and help people free from their addiction. And the people, the farmers, decided to apply that to farming. And they started meditating on the soil, meditating on the seeds, meditating on the growing plants. And this allowed them to create new sorts of seeds that don't need the famous kind of energy. So they are uh, a new energy and they share the knowledge amongst themselves. It's available, but you can't fake meditation. That's the only issue. You, you really need to do the job. Whereas you can't just uh, sleep and say, oh, I meditated. You, know, you do it or you don't do it. But what we've seen is that socially it creates such a beautiful difference because the farmers are proud of being farmers. They love their land. And when you know India, farmers are sometimes feeling a little bit down because they are like considered the last bit of society. But I also wanted to speak of a new project we had called Kalptaru. And this is an amazing project where we teach people how to love a plant, sow a plant, create forests, and we sow I don't know how many in a year, over a million five hundred. I could go on, but I know time is pressing us. But I would say that from the beginning, our university, the founders, have looked into the magic and importance of living simply and serving the elements, the spiritual attitude. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I had a question, but then your last line caused me to think of another question. <laughs> so, the, so the last line that you said, uh, it essentially was about sufficiency. And my question to you is, how would you, how might the world look different and how would you encourage the world to look different were sufficiency rather than accumulation the motivation that drove us? So that is to say, having enough being what we seek rather than always having more being what we seek. And I would love to hear your insights on that when we come back. So finally, uh, we have Gopal Patel from Bloomy Global, and he's also the COP15 Faith Coordination Group uh, representative here. Um, and he's going to speak a bit about the implementation mechanism. And from the multi-faith priorities, it says more details on the implementation mechanism uh, are needed to guide member states as they set out on raising their ambition and integrating the framework into their national conservation plans. The mechanism should allow tracking of progress, the ability to increase action if sufficient progress is not made. Uh, the mechanism should be agreed upon here at COP15. And from your website, it says, we all have a role to play in healing Mother Earth. Blooming Global's mission is to engage, educate, and empower people and communities to address the triple crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. Our work is based on Hindu principles of environmental care. Speak about a bit about implementation, and if I can also ask Kamran to turn off uh, his microphone when he gets a moment, perfect. That would be lovely. Please go ahead, Gopal. I just want to put it on record that I love Birmingham. <laughs> <laughs> on the record, uh, it's a it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everybody else. Uh, I'll give uh, my answers in, in 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 two parts. I'll speak to the work we're doing at Bumi Global, and I'll speak to the implementation mechanism. What we found with our work working with Hindu groups globally is that they want to do something, they know they need to do something, um, but they didn't know how to do something. And so really over the last couple of years, what we've been doing is um, essentially creating implementation mechanisms for a variety of Hindu groups all across the world, helping them understand what they're doing already in the context of global biodiversity and climate change concerns, helping them understand what other faith-based organizations are doing, helping them understand what government policies and funding is available to help them support their work. And we found that when we've just directed them a little bit in the right direction or in other directions, they've been able to scale up much more quickly um, because they felt initially that they were by themselves, they were scrambling, managing a variety of responsibilities in their communities. 
And when they knew that there was a whole network and a whole community of other people out there wanting to work with them, um, they felt much more empowered and enthused and enlivened to do more and that empowered their own local communities. And so that's really been part of the work we've been doing at Bumi Global is um, helping and encouraging Hindu communities to understand the broader context of this work and helping them develop their implementation mechanisms. And talking about the implementation mechanism of the GBF, we know, I'm going to try and use some faith metaphors here, we know that um, a piece of paper is useless unless there is structure around how to implement that piece of paper. So, you know, many of us are representatives of religions of the book, or we have scriptures or teachings, but we also come from institutions. If there was no church, would the Bible be as popular? If, a, if there was an um, Islamic organization, would the Quran be so popular in St. Hindu texts? We know that these books and these scriptures emerged at a certain time and place, but infrastructure had to emerge also in order to get those teachings out there. And that's what's allowed these teachings to persist and to live for thousands of years. And so if we're gonna have a global biodiversity framework, having a piece of paper with 22 targets is not enough. We need to have infrastructure around those 22 targets for how we can mainstream that to every part of the world. And so I look to the world of faith. What do we have in our traditions? What do we have in our religious institutions? We have systems of accountability. We have opportunities for capacity building. When someone comes to our church or our temple, we encourage them how to pray, how to eat, how to worship. We have peer support in our religious communities. We have ways to track how people are doing. Are you doing all right? Do you need some support? Do you need some care? How is your marriage? How are your friendships? We support people. And we ask people in our religious institutions, just as in the GBF, to increase their action. Can you do a bit more? Can you give a bit more to God? Can you sacrifice a little bit more? And so we have that in our religious, in our religious worlds, in our religious institutions. And what we're saying for the implementation mechanism is, we're just asking for something similar, be accountable, support each other, you know, see where there is the need, whether it's the financing or the technical support. And we think without that, the global biodiversity framework is not going to be successful because it will just be a piece of paper with 22 targets. And so a lot of the work we've been doing over the last couple of years with the multi-faith community is, as has been spoken about today, is what are the principles in our communities of faith and spirituality that we can speak into the global biodiversity negotiations and say, we're saying the same thing. And religious institutions, we've been around for thousands of years, will be around hopefully for many more thousands of years. We know how to have long-term success. And so let's lend our voices to the negotiations to help them have long-term success that they're looking for. Perfect, thank you so much, Gopal. So like all the others, I have a question for you as well. Um, so you mentioned that you're helping and encouraging communities. Um, now in, this, in, in your, your various roles, what, um, you know, conceptually, this is easy to say, we're helping everybody. But what, what, at a very practical level, are some of the resources that are actually available to support these different faith groups and these different initiatives? Um, so thank you so much for that first round. So now we have uh, uh, you know, the questions that I posed will hopefully be answered to the best of our ability. And feel free also to speak to what others have said as well. It's not meant to be sort of purely bilateral. Um, but I will reference the questions I asked, and you'll each have about three minutes. And then to all those in the audience here, um, after this round through, you're welcome to ask a, a question or two um, as well. So the first question is for Garunga, uh, and what, what we uh, referenced was the impressive efforts that you have, but what hope do you hope to share uh, with those negotiating? Um, in those in the faith communities uh, can provide three very crucial contributions. First is confidence. As Gopal just said, we have been around for thousands of years. In fact, the latest corporations and even nation states are pretty recent compared to the existence of churches, mosques, and temples. So we carry the confidence of a long-standing tradition and even individual practitioners in faith traditions, if they practice very sincerely, they develop a certain resilience and confidence, which is unmatched. In fact, when we were at the Eco Village, uh, we had a hydrogeological survey specialist come and say how we should create 
uh, water positive hydrogeological survey and that survey cost almost 500,000 rupees. So some of our monks, they said that, you know, we have some local villagers who can take coconut in their hand and they can detect where the water is. It costs only 200 rupees. So let's go for it, you know. So, of course, we decided not to go that route. But an important element is that when faith traditions decide to come close to technology and carry that confidence, then it can create tremendous transformation. Second element which faith traditions can provide is competence. In churches, mosques, temples, various kinds of congregational people do come irrespective of their background. So we have access to some of the most competent, influential personalities. And we can actually leverage and harness their potential, their competence, their abilities, their synergies. And that's what we have done at the Eco Village. Because compared to the actual budgets we have, the kind of resources, especially the human resources made available to us, is mainly because very highly competent people visit us and they devote their time for free. So that is something which faith traditions can provide in terms of competence. Third is very important is collaboration. What we have seen is that many of the systems fail in terms of implementation because people seem to be working in silos. And it's very important that faith traditions can provide that you know, effect of binding all of those various diverse entities in society. And we have to have a methodology by which we can enable such convergence and collaborations. This is something which faith traditions can bring to the table in a powerful way. And especially we can play a major role in improving the cross border investment, impact investing. And also with respect to creating a strong nexus between government, corporates and the NGOs. When there is a strong nexus between these three, then implementation goes to the next level. And therefore, the faith traditions, we can actually put together a portal where all the best practices of some of the work which we are doing, collaborating with faith and collaborating with social impact can be put together and this can become one of its kind of source for people across the world and therefore these are the three things which i feel that faith traditions can bring to the table which is first is confidence second is competence and third is collaboration thank you so much Maronga. so now for sarah the question i asked was uh, about how do you take these these shared values and allow them to find diverse expression in so many different contexts and what lessons can be brought to bear uh, here in that regard. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you again. <laughs> uh, I guess the diverse um, approaches and contexts, that's a given, but we all have a fundamental um, belief uh, that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Um, and we're inspired by God to do our work, to care for creation, um, to show God's love for the earth. So that, that, that fundamental basis makes it a big difference as to being able to cope with diversity and different contexts. Um, we have a very um, strong representation sort of way of doing things that people have, a, no matter what size of organization, they all work together um, to come up with some sort of strategic direction or a position paper we have for here. Um, but taking into account always um, different people's worldview, um, financial situations, whether there are tiny organizations, some of our Arroshas are very small, and some of them are really big, but everybody is equal. And so a representation, I would say, is something really important, and listening and taking time um, would be one thing that we have want to put out there for um, negotiations. Um, governance and making sure that everything is agreed and, and taken slow with strategic direction and everybody having a say, a voice. What other colleagues have said also is shared learning. Um, so that for most things are very similar really, you can just sort of tweak them slightly and they work in most places. 
Um, so we can learn from each other and use that amazing learning, um, but still be diverse in what we do and, and apply it to the context. I love traveling around to all these places and seeing the different ways people do things, the different expressions of our faith. Um, everybody speaking up for nature. Um, that, that would be the, the bottom line of that. But do read our petition paper as well. Put together by everybody. And that's mm -hmm. diversity. We're strong in diversity. I mean, it's a good thing. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. So now the, the question for Caroline is about um, how to ensure a holistic approach when rights may sometimes be conceived of as in competition with each other. Thank you. Uh, today morning I had something around a statement that said, from nature lovers to nature citizens. And that stuck with me because um, arguably we are here to promote the protection of the very nature that we are losing. Um, but um, with the Catholic social teachings, we are taught to be very, very conscious of each of our individual actions in reference to how it impacts um, the, the world that we live in, with people, with the animals, with the plants, with everything that we're talking about, especially like biodiversity. And I was just thinking of around the various entities that have happened since we started um, talking about protection of our common home. We have the Paris Agreement, we have the GPF that is being discussed here, we have the nationally determined contributions and other and other uh, set out um, entities that we have out there. Uh, when we are addressing the question of integral um, ecology, we must make sure that as we speak about the faith and, and the hope and the, and the belief to our God, we must also be conscious and be able to recognize that the same God that we pray to is the same God who's created us to be protectors of that environment that he has also um, availed to us. And so as um, as in reference to the multi-faith um, progress on the on the document that we was launched today, sorry, um, I would like to mention that we need to be more conscious as we develop. Conscious of the fact that we need to have everybody's um, issues represented. Conscious that as we develop, we do not take away the very right to be able to participate in the same space that we are developing for, uh, for everybody. And so referencing back to the louder to see document that was um, that was written to all of us the letter that, that was written to all of us i would like to close by saying that um louder to see 61 talks about hope and hope would have us recognize that there is always a way out that we can always redirect our steps that we can always do something to solve our problem so it's an all it's, it's it's a hope it's an it's an effort that is always there so as we develop, as we as we grow, we must ensure that we are not impacting or changing uh, systems that are not workable for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is that, that was quite brilliant. Uh, so let's move on to Cameron. Um, and the question that I addressed to you was about this this uh, distinction or the reality of the ancient nature of many of our faith traditions and the modern nature of many of the problems that we are facing and how you might um, find harmony uh, in, in that area where others may see some, some uh, challenges. Um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's an interesting question. It gets asked quite often, including even in faith communities. Um, we're facing a climate emergency and we're facing a biodiversity crisis. And, the toolbox contains a number of tools. Faith is just one tool of many. Um, politicians have a role to play. The corporate sector has a role to play. Um, education has a role to play. Uh, so faith is definitely one of those tools. It's it's not the only tool. And you can't take, if, if we go by uh, the statistics that 85% of the world's population identifies with uh, a faith, you can't take that out of the equation. Um, in fact, uh, I mentioned earlier about the uh, climate emergency that uh, the UK Parliament declared. Um, the then Prime Minister, Theresa May, 
she tweeted thanking the faith community um, for the role that they played in uh, calling for parliament to do that. So it's, uh, and also if you look at scientists like Einstein, Isaac Newton, they all had faith backgrounds. So, you know, whether it's a faith inspiration or motivation or whether they have an answer as Gopal mentioned, we can bring different elements to it. But in, in particular, if I go back to um, my city of Birmingham and they're called regional West Midlands police, um, they are now realizing the potential. Uh, so statutory organizations are starting to utilize the power of faith groups like so for instance um, they're engaging with faith groups to retrofit homes to make them more energy efficient um, i think uh, the faith groups uh, including the bahu trust and a few others were instrumental in um, getting birmingham city council to earmark seven million pounds for the local community to upgrade their homes and if they become energy efficient then that has an impact on the energy demand uh, it reduces the energy demand, and then that protects biodiversity. Um, you, we've also got uh, public health, for instance, using faith teachings now to get people to look at the public health factors and start doing things differently. Um, West Midlands Police is using faith groups and faith teachings officially to um, motivate people to do things differently. So as long as faith groups show good examples of how things can be done well and highlight them. And we all, see we have a role to play both as individual faith groups and collectively. Um, but I'm starting to see now that the argument you mentioned that faith shouldn't play a role, I think that's an old um, kind of case now. It's been won over, I believe. Yes, I, I wasn't, I'm not trying to present the argument that faith shouldn't be included. You can give the platform for that point to be made. Um, so, <laughs> thank you so much for that, that response. So now we'll turn to Valerian. Um, and my question to you is about the different results we would see if sufficiency were the objectives rather than uh, accumulation. Please. Uh, thank you for your question. The first thing that came to mind to answer you is the story of the monkey. Do you know how to put a monkey in prison? You put so many goodies in a jar that he can't get his own hat, his head hat. So he, he wants the goodies and he gets killed because he doesn't give up the goodies. And I think this is a good, uh, a good analogy for us and our culture of consumption. We have been made to believe by culture of consumption that consumption makes us happy. And it, uh, the whole advertisements, uh, the whole society basically is pushing us in that direction. But I think faith has the capacity to bring us to our own selves and see the wealth inside, see the richness in God, see the richness into the social um, the social love that we can build in our own communities, but with other communities, the whole understanding of brotherhood, but the whole experience of brotherhood as well, and the whole solidarity uh, links that we can create with one another. But I think the first thing that spirituality does for me is that it's taught me to create a new relationship with myself. Because um, if I don't create a new relationship with myself, understanding that I have the resources inside and I have the capacity to reach out for divine presence and wealth, um, then I'm going to be made inside to feel empty and I'm going to want the nice jumper she has, the nice hat, he has and uh, all the lovely things that she came up in this room <laughs> you know and then it's a rat race and um, so yes spirituality is an answer faith is an answer but it is not something that you can force people to live by it's an individual choice and this is also what i love about spirituality but we are in a good position 
to, um, to, to inspire others. And I think this is our goal, to inspire, you know, hope is not something you can force into other people's life. It can't work like that. And contentment and satisfaction and bliss is not something you buy in the pharmacy. So, you know, it really requires an inner, an inner work. And uh, we are not liars about that either. <laughs> Thank you so much. I wish that we could get that at, at the pharmacy though. <laughs> um, and so now finally to, to Gopal, um, and then again, we'll open it up to the audience for, for questions after his response. Um, so again, you mentioned that you're helping and encouraging communities, but what does this look like? What, at a practical level, resources are available to support uh, these faith groups and efforts? Sure, thank you, Dan. Um, I think for many of us here in the room, I feel like I'm speaking to the converted, that we are part of the faith-based environmental movement, whether it's climate change, biodiversity, ecosystem restoration. And we know over the last number of years, definitely in the last five years or so, there's been a real um, uh, growth of resources for faith-based organizations, both at the international level and at local regional levels in terms of how they can engage with issues around climate, biodiversity, pollution, and, and restoration work. And so, um, you know, just pointing to some um, some uh, key ones are the, the Faith for Earth initiative at, at the United Nations Environment Program, who are co-partnering co on this event. You know, they have a range of resources on their website. Um, you have the Beliefs and Values Program at WWF International. Uh, they are marrying faith and spirituality and beliefs with the science of uh, conservation work and uh, producing good resources. And so that's all at the international level. And then at the grassroots level, I don't think that's for me to say. I think we, all, we are all in communities and Garanga knows what's best for Mumbai and Sarah knows for the best for some of the communities where she is and Caroline and, and Cameron and Valerian. So we all have access to the local resources. Uh, I do want to point us um, and make aware of, of, of one resource that was just actually launched today. Um, that is a resource around um, helping faith communities around tree growing. Uh, so it's been calculated that faith groups combined uh, manage about 8% of, of the habitable land on the, on the planet. And faith groups plant millions and have planted millions and millions of trees and continue to do so on a regular basis. And so uh, a new resource has been released today, um, co-authored by Trillion Trees, the WWF Beliefs and Values Program and the Faith for Earth Initiative. And this is the first ever comprehensive guide for tree growing for faith-based organizations. Um, and it's been in the work for uh, a couple of years. They've consulted widely with faith-based organizations who have been doing this successfully, but also drawing on the science and best practice from other communities as well. And they have a very easy six-step process for how faith groups can engage in tree growing programs um, from you know, understanding the context, understanding the local communities, knowing what trees to grow, which ones not to grow, what time of year, and so on like that, um, knowing how to build in community engagement. Um, and so it's a really fantastic resource. It's available in 10 different languages. Um, if you go to the website of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration and also the WWF International website, you'll, you'll find it there. And that's just one, that's just tree growing, but it's a really, really great resource. And so that's today, but there are so many other resources like that out there, and I think it behooves us to be aware of these resources so we can, because not every pastor, not every rabbi, not um, every swami will know these teachings and know, but if we are the activists in this room, if we can understand what's in these resources and guides, then we can go to the, our religious leaders and say, well, you don't have to do it, we'll do it. And this is the resource from, you know, from these organizations. And so there's so much out there. And, 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 and again, we're all aware of them, but this new one today, I'm very excited to see. This new one sounds like a, a really good tree source. Yeah. Okay. So now, um, as I said, I'm, I'm a father of two young children, so I have to practice my, my puns. Um, so we'll open the floor now uh, to, to any questions from any who are in the room. Uh, and if you could do your best to come actually and hit the microphone just so that people can, can hear you, that would be great. But I have one here, so come forward. And if others two there, so if others raise their hand, We'll make sure to get you here. Please 
do your best to be brief so that others Certainly. can. Um, Don Buckingham from Ottawa, Canada, um, the chairman of, uh, of Russia, Canada. You might think this is a soft love to Sarah, but it's not. Um, I'd just like to, to have the panelists um, comment on the complicated and difficult relationship of our faith perspectives and technology used in advancing bi biodiversity and in fact, perhaps using science not to advance biodiversity, which is part of the problem. Fantastic. Please come on up. Yeah, so you have to push the button. Thank you. Pella Til from Stop Ecoside International and Faith for Ecoside Law. So I hear so much beautiful work being done by local communities and um, and how you empower people locally to do what needs to be done, but at the same time on the global level there's a total lack of accountability. So large actors are actually destroying the living world that we all belong to. And so we are working for Ecoside as a fifth international crime against peace at the International Criminal Court. And I was just wondering if that's part of what you're thinking about or if that's something that you would support. Fantastic, please. For all the panelists, one question that you say that there are 85 percent people who are connected with faith. And I'm sure we all agree that behavior is the most important factor which will determine whether sustainability becomes a reality. So when we are doing things in pockets, what are we doing towards the behavioral change with the faith uh, communities? And can we create um, a centralized mechanism that we track the responsible behavior of the faith communities and report it uh, in a particular manner. So if we create a system for, towards this, I'm sure it will, will be taken seriously. Wonderful, are there other questions? If not, it's perfectly fine, that was plenty. Uh, but I just want to make sure that, that there is an opportunity. So I think we'll take it in the same order and just to briefly summarize what the three questions were. The first was about technology. The second was on ecocide law and accountability. And the third was on behavior and tracking. So you'll each have roughly two minutes, but I'm, I haven't been too strict uh, to, to do your best to respond to whichever you like. Thank you. I'll respond to the one on technology. As I say that the Gita says discipline is the fusion of intention with action. So we firmly believe that as faith traditions, we have the capacity and the ability to utilize all of God's given resources with the right intention. Just like a knife by itself is neutral, but in the hands of a surgeon can save lives. So in my own experience of the eco village, I'm a BTEC from IIT Bombay, and then the architect was insisting we should do eco-friendly, you know, waste management. And uh, I passed out in 1993 and I kind of lost touch and then one day we were eating uh, lunch and one of my classmates was sitting with me and the architect started talking to him and she figured out that he has the technology that was his phd project called soil biotechnology so she started complaining to me hey your your own classmate has the technology which i'm looking for and you never told me i said while he was doing phd he was so miserable i never took his phd seriously <laughs> and that turned out be the game changer. Now we have the soil biotechnology which is processing like we have the plastic to diesel recycling pyrolysis plant. So I mean technology by itself is neutral depending on whose hands that technology lands in. So I think as faith traditions we have a powerful ability to transform intentions as I shared yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, please. Yeah, on the tech oh. On the technology one as well, um, I found myself, it's good, it's bad, both sides. <laughs> um, I don't like, you know, too much technology myself personally, but it's amazing in the world. Um, one of our Russia sort of uh, folk um, related to us has uh, invented a machine. 
it looks it looked like a big coffee table to me, you know, um, uh, and it actually drops tiny, tiny drops of pesticide per plant. It can be the robot that goes out into a field and gets rid of the absolutely the worst, worst, whatever it is, weed, without affecting everything else around it. And it has transformed agriculture. That's technology. Also, drones used to not to annoy, you know, all around and buzzing, um, or going to airports or whatever, but doing the surveys of forests and showing mining destruction and logging, we wouldn't be able to see that without those. Um, but of course, there's, you know, the other side as well, which I always remember, but when I'm in Kenya or somewhere like that, the, the Mpeso, the way that people pay for things these days, incredible. It has actually helped very, very poor communities have money that they can pay things with and that other people can pay something to them so that they can then go and, and buy stuff. So. Um, yeah, um, I, I come out from this side of things at the moment being very quite pro in the world, but when it's used carefully and appropriately and responsibly, that's the word that we're sort of throwing around today, isn't it? Thank you. Sure, I'll take the time as well. Um, <laughs> Someone's going to have to jump in on the other questions. <laughs> we're, we're, the, we're the winner here. <laughs> um, for me, I, I look at technology as a, as a tool. Uh, for enabling um, climate justice and for me innovation really does come into play when you're talking about technology and um, if we're not going to be innovative just like you said Sarah, um, if we're not going to be consciously innovative and ensuring that we the technology transfer concerns that have been raised um, in terms of not being able to be replicable across across the across the table then we have to ensure that the innovative approaches, that we have to speak to those local concerns. And, and for me, innovation for me is a very key plank um, in that statement of technology transfer. Um, jumping on to uh, tracking behavior change, oh, <laughs> um, it's a very, it's a very good, um, what should I say? It's a very good um, statement to say, uh, tracking uh, behavior change. And as the group here representing the different faiths, um when we when we come together at whatever time of the week uh, we come to pray we come to worship and, and and just be together and grow our faith right and in those moments it's it's an opportunity to be able to track the faith element and also to um to speak and engage on um the behavior change uh, so if for the Catholic, when you're talking about issues around the ecology and being conscious as an individual, then my faith does dictate that I should be also uh, well behaved in taking care of my own home. So those things should work together so that it's not working in silos. Uh, we're not just tracking faith growth, but we're also instilling concepts and knowledge on how to become uh, a good human being. Um, just as we know that we are at the center of the climate crisis that we're experiencing now. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. I'll try to answer all three <clears throat> very quickly. You know, in terms of technology, um, so we all benefit from technology. Uh, my issue is with anything good we have, we do it too much. Um, we just rinse everything, and that's why I was quite moved by what Valerina said. Um, if we master humility, simplicity, and modesty, we'd solve the issues. I mean, if fossil fuels isn't a bad thing, it's bad because we just do too much of it. Uh, everything has a role to play. Same with antibiotics. Antibiotics isn't a bad thing. Now it's become a bad thing just because we do too much. So every, it's the greed element that we have to conquer. Um, how we conquer that is another matter. You know, I don't have the answer for that. Um, Maybe you do. Lend my support and for our organization. Um, there is a new document, um, which is, I call it the brother or sister equivalent of Laudato Si, um, called Al Mizan, a covenant for the earth, which is being launched in a, in a few months' time. Um, and Ecoside is mentioned in there. Um, and there was lots of pushback, especially from the non Muslim community, around taking this term out. I mean, I won't go into that now, but if I remember correctly, it stayed in there. And there are Muslim scholars who are talking about 
ecocide. And I think it's not a term people are used to, and it has to go through a legal process before it becomes an official term. But um, uh, we can talk afterwards around how we can. And the be behavior change is not as easy because behavior, you're normally nurtured into a certain type of behavior. So I, it's not our role to track it or to police it or to enforce it. But I do know that changing behavior has to come through legislation, has to come through role models, has to come through all sorts. We've tried, in our mosque, we've tried to change things. I'll give you an example. We've tried to um, uh, just say, for instance, ban plastics because we have single-use plastics everywhere in our mosque. But no matter how hard we've tried, our congregation just keep bringing in plastics every time they're holding an event in the mosque. Why? Because it's cheap and it's accessible. Um, also, there are social and poverty barriers to why people can't change um, their behavior. So there's so many um, complexities um, that sometimes make it difficult to track or enforce. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a word I love that answers a bit of the three. Uh, it's called ahimsa. Uh, the word ahimsa is often translated as non-violence. But it actually means don't do any harm. And I love the principle of not doing any harm. And as I was saying in my first part of the presentation with the solar system, it is technology. But because it came from a very positive space, we found solutions where nobody else has found solutions yet. So what I want to say with that is that you know, I think if people were empowering themselves, uh, technology is just the puppet in their hands. And like the knife example, uh, we, we could create the technologies that would be so friendly to the environment. And then Ahimsa is also the answer around uh, um, ecocide. I, I fully agree with you. I work with Henry Grappi in the IOC, the Interface Liaison Committee with the UNFCCC, and we are really looking in, into that very often in our, our events. But uh, what I think is that we have to track as well as faith-based organization positive behavioral change. Because otherwise, I mean, I come from France, you know, there was a war with Germany at some point. And I think that we were the country where you had the most amazing quantity of donation. You said donation in English? When you, you, you said uh, he had his breakfast alone. And this one, he did something with the wife of the neighbor. You know, you keep on criticizing and telling. So that was the country that denounced most constitutional. So behavior change and tracking behavior, if it's positive, it could be very inspirational. But I think we shouldn't go into the negative side of it. But I do feel that ecocide is tracking the negative, but putting a limit. And uh, I think it's something we should at some point have deep conversations. There is a book on faith and ecocide. I have had the chance to look at it. <laughs> I think I recognize you from that day. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for the great questions. And I don't really have anything to add to the specifics of, of the questions, but I'm just, as I was hearing and thinking about the broader context of why we are here and the, the moment that is that is COP15 and the, and the potential, um, and also the comment that we bandy around a lot that you know, faiths are 85% of the world's population and therefore we have something to do to contribute to the solution. Or we also have something to do to contribute to the problem as well, right? So I think, so I think um, what I'm interested in at this moment in time when there are so many intersecting crises, not just environmental, but social, political as well, is what's the strategy of the faith community as a whole and as different individual faith traditions to get things moving in the direction they need to and sometimes we have to go it together as a multi-faith coalition and sometimes certain traditions need to push for some things because 
they have a stronger voice and more credibility on that. And so like, for me, that's what's really interesting for me. You know, we talk about behavior change, technology, ecocide, all really, really important. But how do we build a container and a strategy that we can move all of these issues without things getting left to the side? And I think that's um, a challenge, but it's definitely the opportunity of all of us in the room today and here at COP15 is of all the targets we're talking about, all the issues, financing, gender, youth, IPL and LCs, you know, there's so many things that we need to talk about. How do we strategically move the needle on all of these things um, in a strong, cohesive way? So that's that's where my mind is. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gopal, and thank you very much to the speakers. I think it turns to me now to try my best to wrap uh, what we heard today. I've learned a lot. I hope you all did as well, and I hope that this recording will stay uh, online because I think it's a, a very useful resource. I won't risk my reputation by trying to summarize. I, I remember there's something about containers, something else about monkeys, and something else about knives. Um, but I do want to mention a few things at the level of principle rather than comedy. Um, the first, the, the, these four elements really stood out to me. First is sophistication. The efforts that we heard today are really sophisticated. They're rigorous um, and they are they are deep. Uh, faith is not a soft thing. It is spiritual belief translated into action. And I think we, we heard that here today. Second is on coherence between means and ends. One thing we've been discussing is about the, the alignment of the means that we take to achieve the ends that we seek. And sometimes that may seem slower, but it also may be more sustainable. It shouldn't be taken for granted um, because it raises the standards of how we approach our problems using tools of humility and modesty, not purely the, the shortest route to achieve an end. The third element is complexity. All of these issues are super complex, and we need a lot of nuance as we try to address them. And we have a lot of tools to test our efforts against certain forms of knowledge. So for example, scientific knowledge is very well recognized in these spaces. But what we're talking about here is testing our complex efforts against spiritual, moral, and ethical standards as well. And that those speak not just to the mind, but also to the heart. I think that's really important to remember. And the last thing, but certainly not the least, is hope. Um, in addition to sophistication and complexity uh, and, and means and ends, we've been speaking a lot about hope uh, and aspiration uh, at the heart of, of all of this. This, uh, as someone stated earlier, there's always a way, there's always an opportunity to change our behavior, to shift towards that which is constructive. And I think uh, that hope is a distinctive contribution that the faiths can really make in any space in which we're engaging. So with that, I wish to thank you all very much for your attention, for your contributions, for your questions, and I wish you all the best in the next uh, two weeks as you continue your engagement at this important uh, conference on biological diversity. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes.